Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. For this month's Bird Notes program, we're going to talk about some of the first avian arrivals to Vermont. Joining us from the Audubon Center in Huntington is bird expert and conservation biologist Mark Labar. Thanks for being with us, Mark. It's always great to see you. Yeah, well, it's always great to be here, Fran. So um, tell us about some of the first birds that are arriving um, after this long winter. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a tantalizing time right now because we're still, you know, March is still heavy upon us and, um, you know, spring is around the corner. A lot of the birds aren't really coming back till the end of April, but we do see our first uh, signs of it. Uh, for me, you know, the red winged blackbird uh, is mm. one of those quintessential birds that as the ponds start opening up, people start seeing them. They'll see them at their feeders sometimes, but um, the conclory call of the blackbirds a great uh, sign on some of the warmer days. Of course, so, if you look up, go ahead. I saw a huge flock of them just the other day. I mean, it was- Yeah, they're, they're moving in and as long as there's open water, you know, they, hmm. um, you know, a lot of times people think of robins, but they stick around more often than not. And uh, so the blackbird's a great one. Yeah. Look up in the skies, Mm -hmm. um, and you may not see flocks of blackbirds, but the turkey vultures are back. Hmm. Um, you know, that V-shaped wing as they fly around. So they're another early returnee that gets people excited about um, the coming uh, season. And then for me, um, I was in town the other day and I heard ring-billed gulls circling above. Now, Gulls come back, um, and it always reminds me of my time up on Lake Champlain and, and getting out to see the terns, which will be here in another month or so. But hearing the gulls squawk, just let me know it's almost time for uh, the boat to get back in the water. <laughs> well, the, the lake didn't really freeze this year either, so. That's that's true. That's true. So, um, but still, there's ice out there. I yeah. don't put it in this early. Yeah. And then the last one is is our chickadee, which has been around all winter, but they're beginning to sing their uh, mating song that, mm -hmm. which you can start hearing out there. So um, just to hear the squawking gulls and the blackbirds going and the chickadees singing is always really exciting. Uh, lets us know that uh, winter is on its way out. Exactly. Those songs in the morning are just sweet to my ears. And, yes, uh, you know, yes. it's such a treat to see all these little signs of uh, spring. Um, speaking of which, what about bluebirds? So bluebirds, yeah. I, I was out in my backyard yesterday and I had a male that was flittering around and twittering away. And, uh, you know, we have a number of boxes here. So um, I had heard them about a month ago, but uh, they're back now and people are starting to see them. That was the male. This is a female, mm. um, you know, on the classic uh, bluebird box. Uh, she's not as adorned as the male, uh, but they're beginning to inspect the boxes, you know, start looking for a nesting place. This is a good time to get out uh, and take out the old material from your nest boxes if you have them. Right. Um, so that the birds have a chance to get in there and, and build, um, you know, start building their new nest. So clean and them out and, and, and or, or set them up. So look at these uh, unbelievable little nestlings. Yeah, so, you know, four to five eggs result in these first uh, little fledglings or not nestlings, I guess. Um, you know, they pack right in those cavities that the bluebirds use. And then, of course, um, you know, they get bigger. <laughs> and uh, this is, uh, you know, a bunch of bluebird uh, probably just about to fledge. Uh, takes them, you know, a couple weeks, a little more than a couple weeks to go from hatching to the time they, they leave their boxes. So, um, you know, great to see, you know, just hearing that twittering bluebird yesterday got me excited and made me look up in the air and, 
You know, spring is close. They were so tight in there, and it looked like there were so many little nestlings. Do do all of them usually make it after after hatching? I mean, it looked like there were six or yeah. seven, and then three. Yeah, they often in. they often do. You know, like anything else, there's mortality that happens, and you might lose a, a bird or two. Mm. But um, you know, when things get too crowded, that's the time when they clamber up that hole and and start testing their wings and, you know, start flying around. Bluebirds will sometimes nest, you know, two times in a breeding season. So mm. once that first batch goes, the adults will be back at it and uh, trying to raise a second brood. Well, tell us about uh, the boxes. You have uh, um, several different types of boxes that should be set up now. And why are they helpful? Why is this important, blue bluebird boxes? So, you know, bluebirds traditionally nest in tree cavities. So by putting up boxes such as this one, this is the classic bluebird box with the one and a half inch hole. Mm -hmm. um, by putting up boxes, we just provide them um, good habitat in, in areas that they enjoy, which is usually out in open fields. Uh, here's another box type. You can see the slit on the top. So instead of having that round hole, the birds go in and out um, through the slit on the top of that box. Uh, but these boxes just give them, um, you know, if they're placed property, properly, like I said, out in a field away from edges, um, the birds will use them. And here's another box type. This has that, um, oh, kind of angled, uh, you know, front end and opening, which is, you know, probably similar to a lot of nesting sites, native, you know, nesting sites that they might use with a branch or something leaning, leaning over that might have a cavity. Oh, because um, it gets so thin at the, at the bottom, but that's more yeah. typical of nature, I guess. Yeah, I saying. guess, I guess, you know, I, I, people traditionally still use and have great success with the older boxes, you know, with the circular one inch hole, uh, but, and the slit tops can be good at times, uh, but you know, here at the center, we have mostly the older type. I was out the other day when the crust was on the snow and I cleaned out all the boxes uh, to get things ready. And now just keeping an eye out for uh, which one the bluebirds choose to use. Okay, and are bluebirds vulnerable? Is, is that one of the reasons why boxes are out there? To, are they losing habitat or? So, you know, they're not a forest species. So as, um, you know, Field habitat um, declines, you know, Vermont used to be mostly cleared, um, you know, 150 years ago, and there was much more mm -hmm. open space. So now as, um, you know, reforestation happens and we've, you know, returned back to a more forested state, they're a little bit more restricted as to where they can nest. And okay. so, you know, again, providing the bluebird box is not only great for the bluebirds, but it's great for us humans too, because we get yeah. to watch them coming and going and seeing the youngsters when they come out and being fed by the adults. And so it, it's a real nice connection that helps birds and allows us to appreciate birds as well. Yeah, they're beautiful. I, I finally got my first glimpse of, of one. I, it was so exciting. Anyway. And, and there are some competitors. So sometimes people will place bluebird boxes close by, you know, tree swallows might get in there um, house sparrows. Hmm. And if you put your box too close to the edge of the woods, you're probably going to get, you know, house wrens and chickadees using them. So box placement is important. Okay. So, uh, we, we've also got, um, a, a picture from a viewer that's really quite remarkable. I want to make sure that we get to it. Um, and, and this is a letter and picture from Fred, um, Edgerly of Morgan, Vermont. He says, it's a nice break from the everyday dreary news of the day to see across the fence. Could you possibly identify this solitary bird that has been coming to my feeder alone, sitting for long spells overlooking the other birds, mainly chickadees, nuthatches, pine grosbeaks, and finches. I live on the outskirts of Morgan, Vermont, closer to Island Pond, and he's going on his fifth 40 pound bag of sunflower seeds. Uh, thank you, Fred, so much for sending this beautiful photograph. Mark? This, real, this really is a great shot. Um, just the fact that um, this bird is sitting there, you can't see its legs. It must have been cold because it's puffed out. This is a young northern shrike. 
Uh, if you look at the tip of its bill, it has that little hook on the end. And northern shrikes uh, will prey on other birds. They're actually a songbird. Uh, but the way this picture is set up, um, you know, it almost looks like it's on a popsicle stick there, uh, <laughs> all puffed up. And I can tell it's a young bird because the dark pat, you know, that eye patch there is not as dark as it would be with an adult. Uh, but this bird is also known as the butcher bird because it will um, come in, it'll eat insects, frogs, small birds, and it'll sometimes stick them on like hawthorn uh, thorns or barbed wire and, and hang their prey out there like that. Oh, that's a little um, gruesome, but... It is a little gruesome, but it, it, you know, it's not a very common bird. We see them in the wintertime. Uh, they, they, that's when, you know, they tend to move further north later in the year. Uh, but that was just a great shot and, um, you know, exciting for the viewer to see that, uh, you know, especially after, you know, bag after bag of seed, <laughs> exactly. um, you know, he's providing uh, a potential food source for that shrike uh, by, you know, feeding all the birds there at his house. So just scale, is that about fist size? Is it bigger? Uh, there wasn't a, a way to kind of scale. It's bird. not very big. It's maybe yeah. the size of a robin, you know, oh, okay. so it's it's a small bird um, and uh, but a very, you know, very effective predator, you know, uses that raptor like bill in order to catch its prey. So uh, okay. I'm sure it was watching all those other birds and that's why it was sitting there. I'm looking for that one. Yes. So if you have a bird related question, you can pass it along to Mark at the address on your screen or you can drop Mark an email. His address is mlabar at audubon.org. Send Mark your questions and pictures and he'll try to find the answers for you on an upcoming edition of Bird Notes. Thank you so much for joining us, Mark, during your busy spring season. I look forward to seeing you next month. Yep, yeah, well, it's always fun to be here, Fran. All right. And thank you for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well.